Thank you, Luann. Uh, during this Advent season, we've been reading through uh, some of the passages from the book of Romans, and each week we've found a key word that we've been lifting up, and the word today is the word grace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. The word for today is grace. But before we get into that word, I want to um, go back to another story that comes from the book of Acts, the 16th chapter. And I'm sure you're familiar with the story. I'll just kind of uh, recap parts of it, and there's a portion that I want to uh, read for you. But Paul and Silas have been put into prison. We won't go into the particulars about why, but they're in prison. And um, starting on the verse 25, it says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God while they were in prison. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. You have to understand that in those days, if you were responsible for prisoners and they got away, you would have to forfeit your own life. And so rather than wait for that to happen in the hands of the authorities, this jailer was going to take his own life because he knew that it, he, it would soon be taken from him because he'd let the prisoners escape. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for light, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, why did he even have any understanding of that? And I would suggest that uh, in their time of imprisonment, as Paul and Silas had been sharing the gospel, this, this jailer had picked up on some of that, some of that jargon, and, and maybe he kind of brushed aside as a bunch of, uh, of a, as a fairy tale, but but now, as this miracle had happened, um, now, he's, now he's a little more serious about finding out from Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And here's the key verse. They answered him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now there's some big words there. Saved. What does it mean to be saved, first of all? What, what, what was he asking for at this point in time? What does it mean when we say, are you saved? Well, the word saved, or to save in Scripture, is the same word as to heal. So to be saved is to be healed. We live in a broken world. We are broken pieces within that world, each of us. We're broken people. We need healing, to be brought back, as Joni Mitchell said in, that, uh, in one of her songs, to the garden. We've got to get back to the garden. It's one of our desires, to get back to the garden, get back to that time when we were in harmony with God. But how do we get back to the garden? How do we get saved? That's what, what must I do to be saved, the jailer asked. What must I do to be healed? What must I do to take the broken pieces and put them together again so that I can get back to the garden, so I can get back into that kind of relationship with God that we were meant to have from the very beginning? And, and Paul and Silas say, well, it's very complicated. A lot of steps you have to go through. You have to believe. And what else? Well, that's all. That's all the Scripture says. What must I do to be saved? And the answer from Paul and Silas is, you have to believe. You have to believe. You have to have faith. You have to have faith. So, is that what saves us? Is it faith that saves us? Is that what we get from this story? Well, there's another step in between that we need to talk about. It is not faith that saves us. Faith is simply a positive response to what God has already done for us. And that's where we come in with this great word that I don't think we spend enough time on, and it's the word grace. 
We're not saved by our faith. We're saved by God's grace. It's God's grace that we respond to in faith in a positive way that saves us. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. If you've got a pencil handy, write that verse down, those two verses. Go home and read them again and again and again. I think two of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, it's by grace. It's what God has offered us. And we accept by faith, but it comes from God. And this is not your own doing. This is, I'm reading scripture now. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Grace is God's gift offered to us. It's not something that we've done to earn. And he says that, verse 9, it's not the result of works so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, memorize those. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. Grace then is God's gift it's God's doing. It's God's part of the healing process. And it's, and remember these words, it's unmerited, it's unearned, and it's undeserved favor. Grace is God's gift. It's unmerited, it's unearned, it's undeserved. We talk a lot about faith, but I think we kind of push grace aside because we have a hard time with grace. Grace is a hard concept, not for us to understand, it's a hard concept for us to accept. There are some things that we are taught that counteract this idea of grace. There are certain what I would call myths that are perpetrated throughout our culture, throughout our society that work against understanding or accepting this concept of grace. So this morning I want to share a couple of the myths that, that kind of keep us from really embracing one of the most wonderful concepts, I would say the most wonderful concept that the Christian faith has to offer the world. Some of these are just secular myths that are around, that, that, that kind of grow up around us, and some are very much tied to the sacred as well. But let's share some of these myths. Myth number one is that it isn't worth anything if I haven't earned it. Now what it is, I don't care. But whatever it is, it's not really worth it unless I can take credit for having earned it. Think about that. We work hard for what we have. We work hard for the house that, that we live in. We, we, we've earned that. For the, for, the, for the car that we have, for, for everything we have, we've worked for that. It's ours. We've earned it. And that's how you get things in this world. You work hard for it. And then you're rewarded for your efforts. At the same time, we have a problem with those and this is kind of another myth, but it really ties into the first one, and that is that you don't deserve it if you haven't earned it, if you haven't worked for it. I don't know how many of you have bought tickets to the lottery or whatever it is that's going on right now. I don't even know what it is, but I know that there's like $400 million out there, and people are buying tickets, and I don't think the last one won, so it's going to go up. So I don't know. If you bought a ticket, that's fine. But doesn't it just bother you when people win the lottery? Unless it's you, of course. Doesn't it just bother you when somebody wins a lottery and what? They didn't do anything for it. They get mega millions of dollars and they didn't do a thing to earn it. Doesn't that just bother you? Doesn't it just bother you when other people get things that they didn't really earn? It just goes against our, our basic sense of principles. That what you get, you get by the sweat of your brow, by the work of your hands. That's how you get whatever it is that you want. You get it because you work for it. 
Another myth that works against understanding the concept of grace is the myth that if you do something for me, I owe you in return. I owe you back. If, there's a TV commercial right now. I, I, I like the little jingle. It's kind of a, you didn't have to do what you did, but you did. You didn't have to do what you did, but, but I thank you. That guy's shoveling snow. You've seen that one? That guy's shoveling snow, and the little old lady looks out a curtain, and she comes out and gives him the box of, who's seen it? Chocolates. Chocolates, okay? Um, then they go on a couple other scenarios of people doing things and then being rewarded with a box of, of course, the chocolates they're trying to sell. But the whole idea is, and it's, a, it's pretty prevailing in our culture, that when you do something, you expect to get something in return. Or, on the other hand, if I'm the one who receives something from someone, I feel obligated to return it in kind. So if you take me out for dinner or invite me over for dinner, then I have to reciprocate by inviting you over sometimes so that we're even, so that we keep everything fair. Isn't that, isn't that the way we operate? Isn't that the way we think? It goes pretty much contrary to grace. And Jesus has something to say about that as well in Matthew 6, verses 2 and 4, in the Sermon on the Mount. And we oftentimes uh, think of this as referring to simply our offerings on Sunday morning. But it's not about the offerings on Sunday morning. It's about alms, but it takes in a lot of other things. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I don't know if that guy in the commercial was shoveling the sidewalk because he was expecting to get a box of chocolates for doing it. Kind of the thrust of the commercial is that he wasn't expecting anything. He was just doing it out of the goodness of his heart. But this lady felt obligated, or she just wanted to share something that she had with him as a sign of thank you. And there's nothing wrong with receiving thanks, and there's nothing wrong with giving thanks. But isn't it fun sometimes just to do somebody for some, something for somebody and not let them know who did it? Isn't it fun to get up at 4.30? In, well, no, it's not, never fun to get up at 4.30 in the morning. But wouldn't it be fun to get up at 4.30 in the morning and shovel off your neighbor's sidewalk before they even get up, and they get up and it's all shoveled off, and they don't know who did it, and you don't tell them? Isn't that kind of fun? Sometimes just to do it, and you don't get anything back. And, 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 and uh, there's just something about that. Grace is like that. God's gift to us was given to us. He, he, he didn't give it to us because we earned it. He gave it to us out of His love and care for us. Which brings me to a couple other myths that are more spiritual or scriptural, in, 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 not scriptural, but uh, sacred maybe. And that is, when we think about God, sometimes we come up with this concept that I have to earn God's love. God's love is earned. We get stuck in the Old Testament. We get stuck thinking that if we just follow certain laws and rules and regulations, that somehow we will earn the love that God wants to give us. But we have to earn it first. And if we keep the commandments, and we love keeping the commandments, we do, at least the ones that we know we can keep. The other ones we kind of ignore. But the Ten Commandments, we can kind of keep the Ten Commandments, sort of. We do a fairly good job of that. Uh, I've never murdered anybody. Um, I've tried to keep the Sabbath. I uh, honored my mother and my father, except for those years between 13 and 18, but other than that, I've honored my parents. Done a pretty good job of that. Um, but, oh, we, we just love to be able to measure how good we've been, thinking that somehow then God is going to smile on us and pat us on the head and say, boy, you've been a good boy, a good girl. We just, and we'd love to pile it on. We'd love to just, you know, and even if it's not in Scripture, we'll add to it just so we can make ourselves feel better about how good we are. So when it comes to the Sabbath, and I, I may step on some toes here, but when it comes to the Sabbath, boy, we, we, just, we, we just add so much to it that isn't even in Scripture. 
Or at least we, they used to, you know. You can't play cards on Sunday. You can't read the Sunday paper. You can't watch TV. All these things, they're not scriptural, but we've added them to it because it just makes us feel better because we can do those things. We can keep from doing those things or whatever, and therefore we feel good about ourselves. But what is grace? Grace is unearned. If we think we have to earn God's love, then there's no grace involved at all. Grace is unearned. It's also undeserved. Sometimes I think I, I, I deserve God's love because I have been a good person. At least I'm better than most people. I'm above average. All of us probably tend to think we are above average. I've been better than most people. I think I deserve God's love. Boy, Jesus came around and knocked that one flat on the ground. Especially if you liked the Ten Commandments. Because Jesus came along in the Sermon on the Mount. He took every one of the Ten Commandments and just destroyed it. He said, you think you're good? He said, you never murdered anybody, have you? He said, if you have thought ill of one person in your heart, you have committed murder in your heart. And he took every one of the... Went right down the line. And tore any kind of understanding that we're good people apart. He said, in the eyes of God, you're not worth it. You're not good enough. There's nothing you can do. But that's where God's grace comes in. That God sent Jesus Christ to this earth, even though we didn't deserve it, even though we didn't earn it, God sent His Son to come and gave His life for us to show us that God loves us regardless of who we are. Wesley referred to it as prevenient grace. And even before we know who God is, even a tiny baby is loved by God, even before that tiny baby knows that there is a God. That before we can do anything to earn God's love, God is already loving us. And God has already done something. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, out of His love for us because of His grace. One last myth, and that is that it's all about me. And the fact is, no, it's all about God. It's all about what God has done for us. It's not about what I've done. Because there is nothing in the world that I can do to earn, to deserve, to merit God's love. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, for us. In spite of who we are. That's grace. That's God's grace. Now, yes, if we go back to the beginning, we need to respond to that grace. If someone hands you a gift and you don't receive it, the gift, it's still a gift, but it does us no good. We have to respond to the gift. We have to respond to God's grace. That's where our faith comes in. What must I do to be healed, to be saved? I must believe with faith receiving what God has already done for me, receiving that. Now, what's my response? That's another sermon. Where do we go beyond that? But now during this Christmas season, let us pause in this moment to simply remember that God loves us, that out of God's grace, God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. to die for us that we might be healed that we might be saved through faith that's what we come to celebrate this time of the year it's God's gift given freely without strings attached not because we've done anything to earn it but simply out of God's love love for us God's grace abounds. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the grace that allowed Jesus to come and give of himself for us.